about short film production in Blender by Sasha. Sasha is a 3D animation director from the Netherlands after receiving his Bachelor of Fine Arts in Education. Sasha directed the animated short film Big Bug Bunny, created with the open source animation tool Blender. Right Yep, that one. Most people Thanks, know it. Well, most people who know about it know about it. <laughs> He then taught pre-production in a 3D animation school in Singapore before joining Owen Studio as director and a full-time storyteller. Oasis, the studio's first animated short film, won 15 TBS Digicon Singapore competition in 2013. This was followed with the short animation The Smelly and The Sperm Wave, winning the same competition in the year 2014. So, Sasha. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you very much. I didn't expect you to do, give me this intro. Um, but okay, so, hi, I'm Sasha. I'm an artist. Um, I will talk about what I know about Python or what I do not know about Python. Um, I'm a Blender user and I want to talk about uh, the production, how we use Blender as a tool in production, mostly for tree animation. Um, while I was doing this, this slideshow, this presentation, I had to remind myself to mention Python every once in a while. And I do use Python a lot, even though I'm not aware of it. So, um, so there's a few topics that I want to talk about. I'm not sure how long this is going to take. So either we're going to have a very early lunch, or um, I'm just going to have to cut it short somewhere. Um, so I'll do a quick introduction of myself, uh, a little bit of, uh, on Omen Studios. Um, I will talk about a little bit about Blender and how Python is integra integrated. Um, I would like to take a look at some pipelines that Omen uses for different productions. Uh, and basically how Blender plus uh, Python is used in some way. Uh, I have some, a few short clips to show, and uh, then I would like to, if possible, open Blender, take a look uh, and show you how Python is integrated, how it can be accessed, and how you can use it to change uh, certain things, even though, that, even though I'm not a developer at all. Um, Okay, a bit about myself. My name is Sascha Goedegebure. I come from the Netherlands. Um, my background is 2D. Um, I have a bachelor in uh, 2D teaching arts. Um, at some point, I think it was 2004, I discovered Blender. And Blender is basically uh, an open source 3D application. And this was the first time that I was aware a little bit of this whole 3D process. It was very interesting, so I spent a lot of time on Blender as a hobby. I kind of ignored my school, so instead of the normal four years, it took me nine years to finish my education. Um, in the end, it has been a, um, how do you say that, an investment, because it's the reason why I ended up in Singapore and uh, direct uh, movies and other things. Um, I consider myself a little bit as a 3D generalist um, with the hobby as a background. Uh, the exception maybe is animation, because animators are a little bit crazy. Uh, sorry, Kelvin. He's the only animator that I have brought with me. Um, so yeah, I mentioned I don't know much about Python. And what I write down here, Python for me is like French for many others. I think it's a great language, but I have no idea how to write it or read it. Um, I tried. I think like many people maybe try to you know, speak other languages. I, I couldn't get past the in whole introduction on, on Python. So I could have, you know, Blender tell me my name, uh, Je m'appelle Sasha, or my name is Sasha in Python, but that's how far I got. So this entire talk is really from the perspective of, you know, an artist. So not really as a uh, a Python developer. And this is the only reason why I'm a little bit nervous because I do I have done talks before, but it's never about <laughs> Python. So okay, um, in 2007, um, 
I started working on Big Buck Bunny. And Big Buck Bunny is an open movie created with Blender. Uh, this was done in the Blender Institute in Amsterdam. Uh, the Blender Institute is a place where they basically work on uh, open content with open source. So uh, Big Buck Bunny itself took around six, seven months. There were five artists in-house from different countries brought together, uh, two developers in-house. Uh, there were also developers working basically worldwide to you know, contribute certain things for Blender development. Um, we call it an open movie because first it was only created with open source, uh, which means Blender. Uh, we used uh, uh, Linux on Ubuntu. Uh, there was no Photoshop, so we used GIMP or other uh, open source software. Uh, the other reason why it was called Open Movie is because we uh, released things, we released everything as sort of open content. We used the Creative Commons license to release all our movies, our files, our data, and we basically gave it to the public and say, okay, this is, this is our production files, this is our movie, you can do with it what you like. Um, the main reason why these open movies are done in the Blender Institute is to work on the Blender development. For example, during Big Buck Bunny, there wasn't uh, good fur or grass in Blender. So they pick a topic, let's say furry animals, and they use that, that open movie to further develop the tools in Blender. Uh, future projects develop tools like tracking uh, and rotoscoping. Um, So, currently I'm working at Omen Studios, I think for around four years now. Singap uh, Omen Studios is basically based in, in Singapore. Um, we are working on different things. We are working on series. Currently we have a series, uh, we had a series running on Media Corps, um, and next year there will be another series uh, running. Um, our ambition is to work on short films. And I think you can kind of see what is series and what is short film. There's a little bit of a quality difference in, uh, in these two. Uh, another ambition that we have is to do feature, so uh, full length 3D animation in the future. But that's, that's quite a big deal, so that's going to take some time to go there. Uh, oh, I just heard from, one, from my manager um, that we're actually looking for people who are interested in helping us with the whole uh, production to jump from, uh, from Maya to Blender and other things that are related to, uh, to the pipeline. But if you have any questions on that, I can maybe afterwards uh, yeah, show you to somebody else. Um, Okay, so about Blender. Now, Blender uh, is a cross-platform 3D creation suite. Now, I say cro cross-platform because we can use it anywhere, uh, on the Mac, on the Linux, on, uh, on Windows. However, I heard some talk about the, currently about Mac, and there seems to be some issues with uh, the, the, I think, the, the graphic cards, the OpenGL, um, I think AMD, I think it's related to how Mac allows for micromanaging for AMD and other, NVIDIA, I believe. So this whole cross-platform thing is, it's currently, it's still the case, and I hope it's gonna stay like that, but there has been some, there are some issues in the Mac world, so I'm not sure what's going on there. Um, so it's a free and open source software since 2002. Uh, the story is quite interesting. The actual uh, uh, Blender started as a shareware, but when the company that released Blender uh, went bankrupt, the original developer raised money. He raised around 100,000 euros to buy the source code of Blender. And after he did that, he basically released it as an open source uh, software. Uh, Blender is basically a, a tool that allows for a lot of multi, uh, like full 3D application stuff like modeling, animation, rendering, compositing, sculpting, uh, video editing, and a few other things that were added later is rotoscoping and tracking. So you can also do feature film effects with, uh, with Blender. 
Oh, let me go back. So currently there are, I, I would say, 50 plus active developers, blend, uh, developers that uh, only a few full-time developers and a lot of developers that work on Blender in their, let's say, let's say free time. Um, I'm, I'm saying 50 plus. I've been using this number for, I think, six, seven years now. So it might be a little bit more. But I know definitely that there are a lot of people that also develop like small things like scripts and basically add-ons and other things. Um, if you're interested in how the development of Blender is and how Python really is implemented, you can have a look at the uh, Blender website. There is, I believe, a, uh, somewhere you can find development on the Blender website. Um, in case I'm giving the wrong information, you can make sure that double check there if it's correct what I'm saying. Um, so, okay, Python in Blender. So, uh, Python comes with Blender. You can download Blender either as, as an executable or as an installed version. Uh, Python is already there. Um, what I understand, and I hope, <laughs> I hope I got my facts correct, <laughs> Blender's user interface is mostly written with Python. Um, what I do know is that there are, Blender comes with around 100 add-ons or scripts written with, with Python. And there are a lot of, a lot of other add-ons that you can find online that people share with each other. Um, the link, the link, the Blender add-on list is just one example of a place where people share all these add-ons, all these scripts. So, and there's a lot of other, there's, I believe, the official uh, repository where you can also find all these scripts. And yeah, um, okay, as a Blender user, I love, I mean, I love developers because they make the tool awesome. But what I hear many times, they say, because a, a, an add-on, a script for, uh, written in Python, it's not always on by default, so you have to enable it. And sometimes a, a certain script is not even in the official Blender release, so you have to download somewhere else. So what I hear many, th many times, I hear people say things like, it should have been in Blender by do default, or it should have been enabled by default. And there must be a good reason why this is not the case. This, I'm sure the developers have a very good reason to do this. Um, I try to understand how developers think. I can't. <laughs> they have a different way of thinking about things there. I mean, you have the artist versus the developer, and I think I rather see it as how the artists and the developers work together to create this great tool. Um, but this is a very common thing that you hear from Blender users or Blender artists. And I, I realize, even though I don't do Python, I understand why it's so important. And I understand that if you are a, a decent artist that can do decent writing, and then you put Blender you know, you give that person Blender, you have a, an amazing powerhouse. You can do amazing things. Um, so why would you choose Blender? Now, the, the first two, they're actually not the same. They're completely different. And the second one isn't really true. Now, basically, as an artist, like, I discovered Blender. It's open source. I can do with it what I can create, you know, things in 3D. And it wasn't before Singapore that I didn't know much about uh, piracy. I think Asia is very more familiar with piracy than where I am from. So, but I guess if you're more familiar with the open source world, then you don't need to worry about piracy. So that was never a concern for me. Now, as a boss, a boss would say, okay, I don't have to buy licenses for the uh, commercial applications. Um, that's true, but however, you're, I mean, you also have to think about training. Most people are trained in the commercial applications like Maya or Max. Uh, so even though that the software itself doesn't cost anything, you have to consider the, the training aspect. Um, now, a very important reason is you can do with it what you want. Whatever you want, it's open source. And that makes it really powerful. It took, for me, a, a a few years to understand the strength of this. Because in the beginning it was like, it's free. So, but as a studio, the fact that you can basically, you can take this tool and then turn it in your own tool. 
do with it whatever you want, making it such a powerful and important <coughs> thing. Um, whatever reason you have as a developer, I can imagine a lot of these above things, like the fact that you can do with it whatever you want. I think there's one important factor for the developer, but I can't speak for the developer really. So you might have your own reasons for that. Um, now, a little bit of information about the, the license that Blender itself is released. I think this is quite important to know, like that you can do with it what you want. You can change it, you can redistribute uh, distri it again, and um, also you can, you can even sell it. But there is this one rule is that you can sell it, but you still have to release it under the same license. So if you want to sell it, you still need to give the user access to the code. So um, anyway, this is one reason why it's such a powerful thing. And it's so much more powerful than, let's say, for example, the commercial applications like Maya. Because Maya and the other commercial applications, their, their main source code is closed. Now, I believe that the main source code for, let's say, Blender is not Python itself. But I think, I'm, I, I'm guessing if you know Python, then I mean, it's still quite powerful for you to have access to the Blender's uh, source code. OK, so the, the, this is a very simple, simple uh, example of the production pipeline. And I'm talking about everything after the pre-production, after, af after the design and after the storyboards. Uh, there is a lot more going on. We're talking about texturing. We're talking about shading. But um, so very simple. Um, Modeling, you need to create 3D objects of your, uh, of your, uh, your, uh, your, your character, your assets, your prompts. And the nice thing about it is you can do it anywhere, and then later you can transfer it easily. There's different ways to transfer to stuff. Uh, you got OBJ, you got, uh, you got FBX, there's all kind of formats out there. Um, now, the rigging and animation, these are a little bit hard to separate. So most of the time, wherever you do the rig, the animation is going to happen in the same software. The, the, the tough thing about it also is it's very hard to transfer it to another software so you can do the, the light and the rendering. Although I will show you an example how we are trying to, to do this right now. But it is a challenge. And though there are formats that allow to transfer your animation to the next pipeline, um, Maybe one software allows for exporting it in that format, but the other f software doesn't allow for importing it in that format. So you have always these kind of issues. Uh, another thing is that animation has a lot of artists. If you look at a studio, most of the artists are animators. So if you want to think about Blender for, you know, use Blender for your pipeline, you're going to have to, uh, you need a lot of to train a lot of artists. So it's going to be much more expensive if it were only, let's say, composting. There's only maybe two people in a small uh, studio that do composting. So that's much cheaper. Now, lighting and rendering, also a bit hard to separate, but it's definitely possible. Because after your lighting, there, there are uh, separate uh, render uh, software um, but uh, again, this is a little bit tedious. Now, the one thing about render, uh, rendering is, is that most of the time you need multiple computers to do the rendering. It takes time to create that one frame. And in animation, you're working with a lot of rendered frames. So many times you need a render farm. You need a lot of computers. Now, if you have a commercial application like Maya, and you would like to render it in Maya, that means every computer needs that license. So every time, let's say 2015, Maya comes with a new, uh, new Maya, Maya 2015. Oh, by the way, your old files won't work anymore. So you have to upgrade to 2015. So your render form, you have to upgrade to, to 2015. So which is very, I mean, for a boss, this is really expensive, of course. Um, so it's very, yeah, for a boss, he would like to move definitely lighting and rendering to another software, like Blender. Now, composting, this is where you basically put all your renders on top of each other. You make it look pretty, etc. Most of the time, you're dealing with image sequences or videos. can be done anywhere. And then the video editing, you basically put all the, the clips together, and you edit it. You, you know, change the timing. can also be done anywhere. 
Now, currently, Owens uh, is working on series, uh, mostly series for preschool. So you can look it up, you might find it entertaining, but okay, it, you're not the target audience. Um, so what you see above is the pipeline that we're using mostly. So we have a heavily uh, commercial uh, software pipeline, as you can see. So from modeling to lighting and rendering, everything happens in Maya. Then compositing, we're using After Effects, uh, After Effects from Adobe. Um, now, the reason why we are using After Effects is because it's a very simple kind of compositing. We could use Blender, but that is, it's a different type of compositing. It's more complex, gives you more options, but for, for, uh, for series, you want to do it fast, quick and easy. Uh, now, the video editing, we're only using Blender for the editing itself. Um, now, so this is the first time. This is a, uh, Captain Smelly. Captain Smelly is a short film we did. Uh, it's the second short film uh, Omen Studios uh, made. And this is the first time that I try to basically integrate a blender in the pipeline. Now, as you can see, I put it, it's under compositing, so it's still not under the rigging animation and lighting and rendering, which is, which is the hardest to implement it there. Um, I would like to show a trailer. It's only compositing, so I shouldn't show too much. Uh, let me see how I can. <coughs> Now, I, I hope it, the audio is clear, but I don't think it's that important. It's a very short teaser, teaser trailer. Okay, so that's the trailer for Kevin Smelly. Um, so this is the first time we use Blender more in the pipeline, just compositing, so basically putting all the renders together, do the color correcting, uh, color correcting and things like that. It's not really a, a heavily uh, Blender pipeline production. Now, this, okay, at some point, uh, this was late 2013, and the Make-A-Wish Foundation approached us, and uh, they had a story about Sarah, and Sarah is a girl, she had a kidney failure, Sarah is the one in the middle, um, Sarah was interested in doing animation, she was, or she was interested in 3D animation. So we invited Sarah, we showed her around in the studio, we kind of showed her how the whole, you know, the pipeline goes, how 3D works. And so what we did, we worked with Sarah to uh, give her her own animation. Now, originally my boss, he wanted to just do a 2D animation and just outsource it. I mean, we're very busy and I understand that. But I felt like, hey, if you want to, if you show her around here, then you should give her at least something in 3D. So me and Sarah, we sat together. We talked about, okay, what would you like your animation to be about? And she talked about her grandmother and she, Sarah had a lot of drawings. So I was thinking of a way to integrate her drawings into the animation. Um, and there was kind of a deadline uh, because we wanted to show it on her birthday. Yeah. Sarah's fine, by the way. She has a, she got a new kidney and she's doing quite fine. Um, so anyway, I took Sarah's project as an opportunity to basically dump Blender into the different uh, pipeline uh, parts. So modeling went everywhere. It happened in uh, Maya, it happened in Blender. Uh, we still use 2D animation. Uh, we outsource this, and this happened in Toon Boom. Um, 
The animation was done in Blender, but we're talking about camera animation, so it's nothing special or fancy. Uh, however, for the first time, we have lighting and rendering in Blender. So that, well, that's a big change for, for our studio. Uh, it was the first time that we could actually do this. So I would like to show Sarah's dream itself. So that was Sarah's dream. Um, she was very happy with it. And uh, I do sometimes hear, oh, it's so short. But in animation, every second is quite expensive. So it just did take us quite a, a while to do this. Um, OK, let me see. Okay, that, okay, this brings me to um, another short film production we're currently working on. And um, now, Sarah's Dream didn't have much animation, so it was quite easy to actually have the lighting and rendering in Blender. Now, for sh the, our short films, which actually has a lot of character animation, uh, it, the challenge is to have animation coming from Maya to have it in, uh, in Blender. So uh, yes, this is our first series attempt to do this. Um, and you can see that the pipeline is getting, yeah, I would say more Blender, more cheaper and cheaper. So uh, some quick examples from our production. And with this, I would like to open Blender and first show you a bit like in general where you can find Python, how Python is kind of integrated, how you can use it, and maybe show some examples. And I, I, I tested everything out before this presentation, so by right it should work. Okay, so um, I hope you can hear me clear. So this is what you see when you open Blender. Actually, this is what you see when you open Blender. And 
Now, the, the, to, to, I mean, as a Python user, I guess you immediately want to know where you can find all the Python and stuff. Now, as, a, as an artist, however, this, so one of the first things that we go to, we look at our add-ons. So basically, the add-ons are all the scripts that uh, the, the Python scripts, they are somewhere in a folder. You're going to dump them in a folder. You can install them from here. Um, is this big enough? How's this? So yes, as an artist, you go to all these add-ons and all these scripts, and um, there are so much things that help you speed things up. And again, this should have been enabled by default. So what I'm looking at now, this is the default Blender. If you open the Blender on, you know, in my office, it's it's completely different. I have a lot of things enabled now. For example, uh, a script like this one. By the way, there are links. There are links to the documentation. Um, there's a link for bug reports. Uh, Blender development happens really fast, so sometimes it might break uh, a script or an add-on. Um, it happens, so you report a bug. And honestly, this is one of the things I love about Blender, is that if I find a bug, even if it's not related to an add-on or something, if I find a bug, I go online, I do a bug report, the next day I can download a new build where this bug is fixed. It's not an official release, but it doesn't matter. I can still install, uh, or sorry, download an executable, just run it, and everything works fine. Um, hmm. So basically, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of add-ons here, and a lot of tests, and some of them are quite I wouldn't say useless. They're not really necessary. They're for fun. Um, uh, I can't show you. The, uh, th there used to be an add-on that allowed for uh, randomizing the theme. So, for example, you can change the theme, which is change your colors. And somebody created a script which plays an 8-bit, uh, like an 8-bit game tune, and at the same time, it changes the user interface. Colors are flashing everywhere. The fonts are changing. The size of the font is changing. It's completely useless, but it's still good fun. Um, now, how to find the default one? Well, of course, there's no shortcut for that. Here. So, for example, uh, some uh, an, an add-on like copy attributes menu. It's an extremely important and powerful add-on, but it's not enabled by default. For example, as a Blender user, like I need to, I have different data, I have different objects, and they have a different scale, or they have a different position, and I want to copy one from one to another. So, with this add-on, I can have quick access to it. Um, maybe copy rotation, things like that. It's a very simple action, so why is it not on my default? Well, it doesn't matter, the add-on is there. So it allows for easy, easy functions, easy access. Um, now, okay, regarding Python, like where can you find Python? So one thing that Blender has, it has um, tool tips. Whenever you hover your mouse, over a certain function or tool or button, it gives you an explanation, but it also gives you the Python tooltip. So if you want to understand where to find this, how to use it with Python, so for example, uh, this function, Python object.rotation underscore Euler. I, I, I have no idea, but I'm sure it can be quite helpful for somebody who would like to uh, do uh, developing scripting. Um, now, another thing where you can find Python, like any action I do here, I can actually view, and correct me if I'm wrong, I can view the Python operation. So any change I do here, it gives me all the, I believe this is the Python script that's basically doing the action itself. So. A simple rotation 
will give me this line, which I can simply copy paste and I can use it, change it, whatever. Nobody's correcting me yet, so I'm guess I'm I guess I'm right. <laughs> um, okay. Now then, another thing. So basically, we have the tooltips, which shows you where to find Python for a specific tool. We have this like Python information that basically shows all the Python actions that you're doing, and. Since Blender is heavily uh, focusing also on the, the scripting and developing, there is actually a layout. I can change my layout. I can do with it my, with my layout whatever I want. I can split my windows. I can change the types of windows. However, um, there is there are some default. Uh, I'm sorry. There are some uh, layouts for certain uh, pipelines or for certain workflows. So if you're an animator, you'll use the animation uh, layout. If you are a scripter, however, then you will go for this one. And so basically, we have the normal, uh, what is it, the text editor, which you can basically load your Python scripts, or you can write your Python scripts. You can execute them from there. And then you have this, this console. How, is that con just console? Is that the correct term for it? I OK, console, thanks. Um, and now I'm going to attempt to write my own script. And I'm sure it's not going to work. So, um, now knowing that all my Python, that all my Python actions will show up, uh, let's say for example, I will create a cube, right? Now it gives me this, does it? It gives me this information. Um, Okay, let's do a uh, let's attempt. I believe you have to start with BPY. Is that correct? Okay, I'll try it. And I copy paste this one. Actually, I want to string different actions together in one script. Now, let me see if this one works. It might not. Uh, where are you? One script. Ah. Is it dot? Import. Oh, import. You're right. Thanks. Is it import dot p b p i? Space. 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 Yay. Okay. All right. Let's let's move on. I I want to I want to create a subdivision. Hey. So I want to create a subdivision on my um, on my cube and. Now the actual, this is a modifier. Now a modifier, so Blender has different modifiers. It allows you to deform, change your, your object. Uh, these are not Python. What I understand is that Python is too slow for that. Can I say that? I, I don't know. However, you can of course man use Python to manipulate the modifiers. Now modifiers are non-destructive, uh, meaning that, okay, I can, uh, Whoa, screw. Okay, that's a bad idea. Ooh, screw. So I can basically, my actual mesh is still this cube, non-destructive, unless I, um, what's the word? Unless I apply it. If I apply it, it becomes destructive, so I change my actual mesh data. So, however, I just wanted to do the subsurf modifier, so, or, or subdivision. Let me do that one again. So I need the uh, um, All right, let's try that again. Okay, great. Created the cube, put a subdivision service on it. So uh, obviously a lot more complex things than this, but this is the basic idea on how to use the, the Python inside your um, uh, your scripting layout in Blender. Um, okay, so with that, I would like to show show some uh, an example. Show the gnome character. All right. Um, I don't know. <laughs> uh, okay, so basically. I have a I have a character here now. The, the one of the things that we're using to transfer the animation from Maya to Blender it's called MDD. It's a format. It's a mesh cache 
uh, mesh cache animation data. So basically, every every movement placement of a vertex, like a point, is basically in this file. Um, I like MDD. However, it has to be perfect. Now I can show you how it looks like. So basically, I have so this is my character, and I have a mesh cache modifier. So if I go to the MDD, all right. Now the eyes are separate, so the eyes would have would need its own MDD modifier. But if I play this. I have my animation. Um, now let me lower the subdivision so it's a bit faster. Now the order of the modifiers is extremely important because, for example, if I put my subsurf, which is my subdivision, if I put it higher, if I put it on top of the mesh cache modifier, then the mesh cache modifier is going to say, hey, your vertex doesn't match. There are too much vertices in this. So the, the order is extremely important. And it slows things down a lot. Um, so I need to put my mesh cache on top of my subdivision. OK. Now, this, this, this spe uh, specific uh, asset has also some other things. It has, for example, like a beard in a modifier. It has different hair particles, etc. Now, um, all this data I can access in this file. So I have this GNOME uh, file. I can access all this. I can change. I can change the shaders. I can change the hair, stuff like that. However, when you work with animation, you would like to link things. You want a reference. So this is the original file. It's a, it's a heavy file, currently not that heavy. But if I'm going to do the animation or the rendering, I don't want to use this original file. I want to link it in. So I'm just going to quickly link in the, uh, the asset, if I can find. All right. So this is my LinkedIn character. Now, unfortunately, or actually it's a good thing, I cannot access all the data, all the data, the modifiers, the shaders, and stuff that I had, I cannot access it here because it's linked in. It's basically you can't change it. If you want to change it, you have to go to original file. And it's very one, very, an amazing add-on. It's an, an example of an add-on that I use over and over in the pipeline. I have to enable it because I'm using the default Blender. Um, library. Edit linked library. Uh, I believe I first have to save this file. So let's say, for example, I use this file for lighting and rendering. So I save it. Lighting. However, I want to make a change. I can't see the beard. I can't see. Uh, then, so this, this add-on that I just enabled, I need to go to relationship and somewhere. OK, so what this one does, this one will save this file, and it will open the, the selected linked object. Let's try that. So now I am in my original file. This is where I can make all the changes. But maybe I want to change the color on this guy, maybe just his body. So with that add-on still enabled, I can basically return to the, the uh, original file. It's going to save this file. It's going to. And it's uh, and it's working, okay. Now I you saw maybe earlier a photo of the uh, of the gnome house. There's a lot of assets there, There's, and every asset almost has its own file. So when I dump all these things together, I want to make a small change. I use that add-on to quickly jump to the original file, make a change, and then go back to the uh, to the set. So it's an extremely powerful tool. Now, I can, however, also use Python to kind of overwrite um, whatever I want to see or change here. So let's say, for example, like I changed, 
in the original file, I changed his body to green, but I actually don't want to do that with the original file. So what I can do, I can use Python to overwrite this data. I'm going to make an attempt. Now, for example, um, I can do I can do a few port rendering, but there's no beard. Uh, I I, I want to see his beard in a few ports. If I render it, it'll show the beard, but I would like to see it here. So I'm going to try to enable it using Python. Um, uh, Blender also has an autocomplete function. So I just type a few letters, and I'm sure you guys know that. Um, No, not this one. Um, modifiers, hair, uh, let's go for mustache. Uh, show. Uh, is, I leave one. Enter. So now I have my, so it's overwriting the the original data without changing the original file. So that can be quite powerful, I think. Um, so, okay, I would like to show another another example of an, 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 uh, an add-on that's extremely powerful for me to use. And I will open the original GNOME file. Have some. Uh, I have some different clothes. Perhaps this one. Okay, so what you're seeing here, so this node tree is the shader. These are the materials. Currently, I'm, we're looking at the materials for the face. Uh, we have uh, an image texture, which is basically the, the, the color texture. We've got some color corrections. We've got some uh, shaders. I believe like this is like physical correct terminology, like the BSDF uh, for the shaders. Now, however, like there's a lot of nodes going on. Actually, not that much. It's going to be a lot more later. I want to know what each shader does. Currently, I can only see the output, which is this one. I can only see the output in my 3D view. So, however, there is an, an amazing add-on, and it should be on by default. It's called the Node Wrangler. You enable that. Now, this add-on allows me to view the output of every individual node. For example, now I have the flat colors, the flat textures. I have some color correction. This color correction I'm using for the subsurface scattering, which makes it a little bit slow. So what you're looking at is all the individual outputs. Diffuse shader. This is just the diffuse shader. If I combine it with the subsurface scattering, I get this one. What is it missing? It's missing some glossiness. So this one which can be extremely rough or extremely sharp, I combine with this one. So every individual node can be seen and changed. And I have a bum map, I have, so it's, I said, for, for anybody who's doing the shading, this is extremely powerful. This is, this is a great add-on. Um, how's my time? Oh, that's great. Because I was thinking if I don't have enough time or I have more time, I just show like random nonsense uh, add ons, but I don't think it's very necessary. Um, shiny gnome. So, yeah, that, that, that's pretty much it. So.
So, I, yeah, if there are any questions, um, I hope I give some information how, how Python, <coughs> how important it can be for Blender and for the, the, the pipeline or the workflow. Um, and I want to say that if you're actually really interested, the, definitely go to the blender.org website because they're always looking for developers, people who would like to contribute. Um, yeah, that's it. Any questions? Yes. What would you say has been your your biggest benefit to using Blender? It sounds to me like you you, you said to us, "Oh, Blender is great. Uh, you, you can make whatever you want." I get the impression your studio isn't modifying Blender at all to be what your studio wants to be. Okay. But you did say like, "Oh, I found a Blender board. Somebody will give me a build tomorrow, maybe with a fix." That sounds awesome. What other values are you getting through Blender with your studio? Well, for me, I mean, as an artist, I want to create. You want to create. And I mentioned the piracy, right? And I, w I never considered pirating stuff. I was never aware of that. So when somebody pointed me to Blender, I was able to create. And I think this is one of the philosophies for Blender. And because the main developer, who was also my boss in, in Amsterdam, he doesn't want to put Blender in Hollywood. He wants to put Hollywood in Blender and give Blender to everybody. So that means that you, 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 you want to do Blender or Hollywood stuff? There you go. We share it, just do with it. And he understands that artist wants, just wants to create stuff. So it kind of, for me, that was the most basic, yeah, the basic thing that it gave me. So, and yes, and then I, well, I have to say as a studio, because if you really want to benefit from Blender as a studio, uh, then you are you want you need developers. Unfortunately, currently we're kind of lacking developers. So I we I think we're kind of looking for developers, uh, people that can help us uh, improve Blender with the pipeline, things like that. I mean, I mentioned like if you're an artist and you can develop, wow, the things that you can do, it's amazing. And I know some great artists that can do write awesome scripts. Oh, I'm it's, I'm so jealous. I wish I could speak French, but I can't. So, I mean, Python is just, it's a language that I'm trying to understand, but I can't. Yeah, so the, uh, the render farm uh, portion, is that more uh, scripted and automated? Do you end up having people write scripts to do all that? That's not that manual, is it? Uh, it depends. If you are lacking developers, you will be doing a lot of manual stuff. However, there are scripts. Uh, I'm not sure if you're talking specifically about Blender, or are you talking about 3D in general? Well, I'm assuming for the for the Maya type stuff, Maya has a nice service to so the big render farms. Right. You just give them something and they do it. But on the Blender side, um, one, I'm asking, do you write your own scripts before you send off to the render farm? No, and when I say render farm, I mean in-house render farm. Sure. Yeah. So, I'm, and if you're talking about render farm online, then there are different uh, online services that provide also currently for Blender um, uh, rendering. Now for in-house render farm, uh, yes, currently it's really for Blender, it's manual. So however, there are scripts that you can use. But we're a very small studio, so I just, I don't have much computers anyway to use. Uh, th th there are scripts, there are different options, yeah. I I don't I think maybe it's like some of our brains work different. Like for example, like when I watch a movie, I look at it with a completely different eye than another person would, and the same is with I guess language or programming language. I can't grasp it. So when like, like French, for example, or other language, the way we learn like certain things is by conditioning, right? Like French, for example, I can speak some lines, but I don't understand it. It's just by repeating it, I know it. And the same is with Python. I could learn by simply repeating, but I don't understand. It's like I don't understand the grammar of French. I don't understand how the grammar of Python. I'm more visual, I'm even more of a visual person, and this whole like, Ah, import PP. 
you know, I, I, I can't do it. Yeah. But do you have anything to say about like, maybe the documentation of tutorials? Oh, well, I, I mean, there's a lot out there. And I think the Blender website refers to a lot of them. Uh, I tried one of them. I think it was a very clear, like, introduction, different steps. But even the intro was like, oh. And then maybe the idea that, I mean, again, this is, you have to, I think it's possible. You just have to invest a lot of time, right? So when I went through the introduction, I was like, oh my God, if this is just the introduction, it's going to take some time, just like uh, learning another language. So I think it's possible, but it takes time. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I noticed, I'm just the opposite with Blender. Like, I don't like having to use the GUI. I only want to use Python. So for the shaders, I wish I could, I mean, it's just a, a GUI to make an equation. Why can't I just type an equation? Why can't I have to draw lines? Uh, so yeah. It sort of allows you to go from either direction, from code thinking into animation or from graphical thinking into something. Yeah, it shows, no, it shows a difference that, you know, the developer and the artist. Uh, and I have always have found the relationship with the developers quite interesting. And, and yes, it has always been moments that there will, we will never understand each other. But there has also, also been a lot of moments that, hey, we understand each other, we can work together, we can help each other, and yeah, that's great. Uh, yeah. Any other questions?